There you Back to that 
past couple of years where you know work, employers have really cut down their workforce, and we've seen some modest improvement in the economy, but not to the point where uh, companies are starting to hire again. So it's just interesting that you know that many of us are un underemployed, and I mean Connecticut unemployment is right around eight percent, which is you know a pretty high number. So a while back, Time Magazine put out an article, and I think they did a really good job of kind of, you know, the takeaway from that is, is hey, the workplace is really changing, it's going through a shift. And so they said, throw away the briefcase, you're not going to the office. You can kiss your benefits goodbye to, and your boss will look much like, your, your new boss will look much like your old one. There's no longer a ladder, you can never get to retire. So there's a world of opportunity out there to figure out a new path. And so, you know, I'm here today to talk to you guys about networking and the value of networking. Now, I believe it's a critical component to the success on that path. Um, and so, you know, last month I was out in Chicago, uh, more I mentioned I'm on the board of directors for the National Resident Records and we have an annual conference. And the keynote speaker, you know, made a very, uh, a very empowering uh, point that I'd share with you today. So we've all heard this uh, phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Right? And I think to a certain extent we can all acknowledge there's some truth to that, right? Um, well, he took it a step further, and he said, it's not only what you know that's important, certainly who you know is important, but in today's environment, it's actually who knows you, right? So, who knows what you're good at and who's looking for you? You want to attract people to come to you to ask for your services, whatever area of expertise that is. And so, he made the point that, you know, your career is going to be equal to the power of your five best friends. And I thought that was really important to take a step back and kind of interpret that a little bit more broadly, you can say your career, you know, your success, your long-term viability in today's changing environment is going to be largely dependent on the strength of your network. Okay? So think about that and, and as we go through the presentation, you know, we're going to talk a lot about how networking can be valuable and I think that's really just a key point that we want to go through today. So just a little bit of an overview on the program. Um, what we're going to cover. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, kind of where I've come from, what I've done. We're going to talk about, you know, what is networking. I want to hear what you guys think networking is, so we'll talk about that. Um, a lot about value, we've already mentioned that. I think some people here probably said this, I hate networking, right? So we'll talk about, you know, why do you hate it? How can we get past that? What, what things can we do to help you um, get past that? We'll talk a little bit about uh, social media, how that plays in, you know, LinkedIn, all those good things the do's and don'ts, and then of course the takeaway. Um, if you guys have any questions too as we're talking through this, please feel free to you know, reach out and have a conversation. I like dialogue, so you know, feel free to ask questions. And then I think all of you probably have an index card uh, that you came in with that was on your seat. Hang on to that. We're going to be jotting down a few notes on that. And the goal is that when you walk out of here today, that index card will give you a little bit of a roadmap on how to start networking and some things to do to, to get that up. So a little bit about myself. Before I mentioned, I did my undergrad electrical engineering here at UConn, so it's great to be back on campus. I think every time I come here, there's new buildings, and uh, it's a much nicer environment than when I was here. So enjoy it while you're here. I tell you, it's definitely the best time of your life. Um, after I graduated with an electrical engineering degree, I you know, knew that I wanted to be more in the sales and marketing and business side of things. So I got uh, lucky enough to get a job in that kind of uh, environment, and ultimately made the decision to get uh, an MBA. So I've been in the electrical industry, which you know, kind of makes sense based on my education, for over 10 years. Uh, I've done sales, application engineering, product marketing, product development, and most recently, or currently, you know, working in global sources, more of an operations function. Uh, I kind of looked at what I had done in the past and what I wanted to do in the future, and for me, it's all about always gaining new skills and diversifying accounts. So I had wanted to get some exposure to operations. I had done sales, I had done engineering, I had done marketing. Next thing for me was operations. So when the opportunity came up through a networking initiative, um, I took it. Um, in addition to what I do full time, I also have a consulting business where I offer uh, professional resume writing and career services. Uh, to where I mentioned, I'm on the board of directors for the National Resume Writers Association. I'm a certified professional resume writer. Uh, and I enjoy doing that stuff because I enjoy you know, helping people succeed in their careers and watching them be successful. Uh, I'm also active in the IEEE, which I'm sure you know, many of you are familiar with. I uh, do some mentoring services through IEEE and studentmentor.org, and I'm also on the board of directors for another association, the Institute for Supply Management, which is a um, 
professional association for those that work in supply chain and logistics and things of that nature. Um, so how many electrical engineers do we have in the group here, just so I get a feel? I don't know. One, two, it's three, four. So what's everybody else? Mechanicals? Mechanical? I know you are. Computer science or right. industrials or manufacturing engineers, anybody? So the company I work for uh, full-time is Hubble Incorporated. We're a 125-year-old uh, company founded by Harvey Hubble. Uh, the first patent that he had was actually on the pull chain socket, which you can see right up there, which is something that actually has still broad application and broad use today, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we are a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Our stock is at an all-time high of around 108 or so. Uh, we you know, weathered the recession, came out of it much stronger than we went into it and the company is doing very, very well. This has positioned itself very uh, effectively for growth long term. Uh, very healthy company financially. We've got revenues of about $3 million. We've got about 12, 13,000 employees across the world. Uh, we have over 30 different business units, again, spread throughout the world and about 30 or so manufacturing sites throughout the world. Um, we operate in kind of three main industries. Uh, the power section of the business, which is higher voltage, transmission, distribution, utility type products. Um, substations, things of that nature. Uh, the lighting platform, which makes all kinds of lighting products for commercial, residential, industrial, outdoor, stadium type lighting. Um, and then we have the electrical uh, platform, which is by far the broadest and most diverse segment of our business, and that's where I spend my time. We make everything from switches and receptacles, floor boxes like you see here, um, low voltage products, things for the commercial, industrial, residential markets as well. And our company, uh, you know, kind of our core philosophy or our mission statement is focused, number one, on quality. You know, if you talk to people in the electrical industry that know our types of products, Hubble is always widely recognized for quality and we maintain that. Um, we're committed to the industry and the customers that we serve, and we, we give back to the things like professional associations. And we're also very heavily invested in it more and more every day in R&D. Um, we just built a new, uh, we put a new building up in Connecticut, not too long ago, with Shelton, where we consolidated several locations. And there's a significant amount of money spent on the internal test lab. That gives us a lot of advantages competitively. We're, allowed, we're able to now test a lot of things in-house that before we had to go outside, for, which cost us more time and more money. So we can get products to come faster. We invest in a lot of rapid prototyping. You guys have probably heard about 3D printing and SLA machines. We have several of those right now. So I mean, as a product manager, when I was doing that job, it was great because I could actually come up with a design with my engineering team. We could model it up and add or shoot down to the model shop, and the next day I can have a, have a real working model that I can take out and show us and say, what do you like about this, what don't you like about this? So technology has really changed the way we do business, I think mean, it's changed the way everybody does business. Um, and it's a great company to work for, I enjoy being there. Um, what I do today for them is like, it's like global sourcing, so I travel, I spend a significant amount of my time traveling around domestically to our different business units, and then internationally to our supply base, and I try and match up you know, what my business units need with suppliers that have the capability to deliver a quality product on time through a supply chain. So I want to hear from you guys. Back to the heart of the presentation. You know, what is networking? Who can tell me what networking is? Nobody. Making connections, okay. Good. For what purpose? For whatever your goal is. Whatever your goal is might be. Making connections, I like that. I would say, I'm going to take it even a step further. Uh, making lasting connections, right? So it's not a one-time interaction. It's not a, hey, what can you do for me? Well, you don't have anything for me, you don't have a job, and you have to, I'll see you later. It's how can I make that connection and make it last, right? So um, that's a, it's a great answer, and I think it's a good, uh, good way to take it even a step further. And so it's not about finding a job always. It's about building those lasting connections, um, you know, relationship building. Um, you know, it should be a lifelong and career-long process. So. I have a lot of clients that come to me you know, that have been in the same job for 50 or 20 years, sometimes longer. They've never had a resume, because they never needed one. They've never done any networking, because they didn't have to. But they went into the office one day, and they lost their job, and now they have to start from scratch. It's really, really difficult when you've got that much tenure to you know, be kind of put out on your own um, without anything to kind of lean on. So if you have a resume, no network, you know, it's very um, you know, awakening. And so I would stretch to you guys, you know, as early as you can in your career, start networking, 
It's, it should be something you do every day without even thinking about it. Um, create, uh, I tell people a lot of times too, also to create what I call a living document, right? So whenever you get a new job, it's the first thing you do, update your resume, okay? And so as you get new jobs and you do new things, keep a living document of all the different things you've done, all the different you know, uh, skills you've acquired, accomplishments you've done, money you've saved, money you've made in the company. And it may be 20 or 30 pages long, but when it comes to the point where you have to make a resume, now you've got a ton of content to pull from, right? When I talk to people and I work with clients, a lot of times they don't remember what they did. You know, they can't quantify it. Um, and so having all that stuff that you build over time, you know, it's a lot easier to do it long term than just trying to cram you know, all that before. Just like we study for an exam, right? Um, so, and, and you know, mutually beneficial is, is super important. You know, you have to be valuable to the people in your network, or you're not going to get anything back from them. So always think about that. Think about you know, your philosophy shift, and we're going to talk a lot about this today, is you know, how can I bring value to people in my network? Not always thinking about what can I get from the network, and if you think that way, things will just come to you. You don't have to work for them, they'll just come to you. It's amazing how that happens. All right, so the next slide. There's not a lot of electrical engineers in here, but I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to be able to tell me what this equation is, right? Even, even the non-electrical people probably know this one, so who's got the answer? Right, so what's the name? Do you remember the name of it, the equation? Ohm's law. Ohm's law. Right, okay. <laughs> so like, he's got to be a sure this is too easy. Okay, so that's Ohm's law. Nice job. I don't know the price for you, but I think we'll get you a free slice of pizza for that. <laughs> Alright, so how about this equation? It's only three variables, so it's still pretty simple, but it's a little bit more maybe focused on engineering, but more on the MBA side of things. Anybody have a guess? Okay, this is the value proposition, right? So value equals benefit over cost. And the value is positive when the benefit outweighs the cost, right? So you have positive value if your benefits are greater than your costs. Okay, very important. And so, you know, an example of that is, you know, who here, you guys are all in college, right? Who here uh, drinks beer? Everybody like beer? You can, you know, the big thing now is kind of the home brewing movement, right? You can go out and brew your own beer, right? And it's a fraction of the cost. You can make a five gallon thing of beer for probably you know, 10 or 20 dollars. But, you know, you gotta go out and buy the ingredients. You gotta kind of know what you're doing, right? You gotta keep that at a constant 65 degrees. It's really tough to be tough you know, You've gotta make sure it ferments correctly, otherwise it might not have uh, the bubbles in it. You've gotta uh, take the risk that when it actually comes out, it's gonna taste good. Who knows? I have friends that have, you know brewed batches of beer and they're drinking. He's like, oh, this is horrible. You know? So you can save a lot of money, right, by brewing it yourself. But there's also value to being able to go to the store and buy, you know, a six pack of your favorite craft brewery for ten or twelve dollars. It's going to cost you more, but there's some value. There. You don't have to take that risk. You don't have to spend the time. You don't have to do things. So you know, um, that is, I think, the key of what you know value is. And let's talk about now. You know, how is networking value? So there's a lot of a lot of uh, reasons why that would be valuable. You know, if you have a target company that you want to get into, that you want to work for, or a target industry that you want to get into, um, you know, how do you find your way into that organization? Or that industry? You know, networking is probably the number one way to get there. Find somebody who's working for that company that can introduce you or give you some pointers, some tips, things of that nature. Um, you know, we talked about it's not, what, it's not only what you know, who you know, but who knows you. So you want people to come to you when they're thinking of. You know, hey, who's the best uh, computer science programmer I have at UConn, the graduate program? They want, you know, someone to pop into their head. You want them to think of you. So always, you know, promote yourself in that respect. Um, you know, hidden job market. Everybody's heard that terminology, the hidden job market. Um, you know, a lot of jobs, and we'll talk about in the next slide, typically the estimates over 80% of the jobs that are out there are never actually formally advertised or promoted through, you know, Monster or uh, Career Builder or LinkedIn. It's all about them. So how do you position yourself to, number one, identify those opportunities? or have people come to you when those opportunities arise. Um, you know, we talk about this too. Your network will serve as a springboard or support structure if you become unemployed. Um, and again, that's not something that you can do the day after you get unemployed. It's something that you're doing continuously in that process so that when something like that happens, you know, it's okay. You feel comfortable. Hey, I can call these three people. We'll sit down and we'll grab a cup of coffee and talk about some options, see what might, might else be out there. Um, instead of scrambling and saying, oh, you know, my gosh, I don't even know how to network. I think this is important too. It keeps you, you know, fresh, sharp, challenged, and relevant. 
Um, you know, we as human beings are very much creatures of habit, and we tend to look at things in the same way for a long period of time, especially after you've been working in a certain industry or company. Um, that's kind of the lens that you see things through. And it's important to you know, mix with other people, um, you know, other types of engineers, or even people in business, people in marketing, people in finance or accounting, to get different perspectives. Um, you know, we do that a lot in our company. We'll bring people together cross-functionally, and you know, you just have somebody else in the accounting department look at a problem, and they may throw a really crazy idea on the table, but you know what? It's valuable information. It's worth looking into. Something that maybe I would never thought of coming from the marketing or engineering side. Um, the same thing happens. We actually bring in suppliers and customers and have them sometimes with our problems, and they'll, you know, have some knowledge on some new technology that's coming down the road that we can deploy and things like that. So I think you know, diversifying who you are. Uh, you surround yourself with is extremely important as well. This I read in an article recently. You know, it, was, it was a comment that came out of an article I think on LinkedIn. You know, everyone's responsible for business development. Business development. You know, what does that mean? It means that in today's environment, again, the way companies do business is changing significantly. Just because you guys are engineers doesn't mean you can't talk to customers or you shouldn't know exactly what your company's you know, core competencies are and what their strategies are long term. You should be able to articulate those things. You should be able to understand what the customer's needs are, so you can incorporate that into the products or services or software programs that you're designing. Um, and that's, again, the way businesses work today. There's a lot of cross-functional engagement. So you know, we'll put together a team of engineers, a team of you know, marketing guys, sales guys, and designers, and they'll all work together, kind of in real time, and manufacturing, to try and develop the best product that meets all the different needs. Has the customer's looking for, price competitive, you can actually make it, because I can't tell you the number of times you know, we've had engineering come through and design a product that then you kick over to the manufacturing guys and there's no way they can make it cost competitive, right? Um, you, you know, you can always get things fast, cheap, or good, but you can only get two of those, right? So you can't get all three, it's always a matter of which two you, you decide to go with. Um, it can be a path to success, you know, there's a lot of opportunities that will come to you through networking if you have a strong network. And, you know, believe it or not, it actually can be a lot of fun. So the hidden job market, you know, we talked about that. You know, a lot of the estimates are in the 80 plus range as far as the percentage of jobs that are in the hidden job market that you'll never see advertised. Um, so you look at this, you know, what's the first way a company looks to fill a position? You know, step number one is the internal move. We have somewhere that we can turn mobile from the You know, that always makes a lot of sense because the company wants to invest more in the They want to promote people, they want to give them more opportunity. Um, so that's usually the first step. Not always an option, maybe they don't have the right skill set. Maybe they don't have something to backfill the position that person's in. Maybe they just want to get a different perspective from somebody outside the industry or from a different function. They want to bring somebody in to shake things up and to do some change. Um, so then they're going to go to network. Hey, do you know anybody who's good for this role? Right? Because you know, as a hiring manager or a recruiter, if you can get somebody through a recommendation or a referral, it's always so much more valuable because you're having somebody else kind of bet that this person is good for the position. So it takes some of the stress and strain and responsibility off yourself. Um, so, so recruiters and hiring managers love to get referrals. Um, you know, and then of course you have the kind of traditional yeah, semi-resume out to recruiters, um, to headhunters, let them you know, look at it and see uh, what positions might be available. And, and another thing to keep in mind when you're talking about um, you know, headhunters or, or uh, recruiters, things of that nature, you know, those guys don't work for you, the job seeker, they work for the company. So their job isn't to find you a job, their job is to find the company the right candidate, they're the one paying the bill. So, you know, don't think headhunters are working for you. They're not. Um, they're not out there trying to find a job for Steve Bouchard. They're out there trying to fill this position. If I'm not the right fit, I'm out of their head as fast as I got into it. They're on to the next candidate. Okay, so a lot of people will get frustrated and say, hey, you know, why is this recruiter calling me back? I'm sending my resume. I have a great resume. I'm a great fit. If you're not, you know, exactly what they're looking for, they're on to the next thing. So only spend so much time doing it that you, that you have to. And of course, job posting. I mean, you can search Monster, Career Builder, LinkedIn, all those things. Um, and I'm not saying that those aren't important, but I'm saying you've got to work across all of those different uh, uh, actions, all those different steps there. And you look at where, you're, you're, where the most return on your time investment is, you know, the networking portion, right alone, 45% you know, in that neighborhood. So that's the best return on your time investment. And then you know, spend time doing resume and job postings, but make sure you understand where your time is going and what the potential return is on that. So does this make sense to everybody? To get value from your network, you've got to be valuable to your network, right? So, you know, think about what you can give other people first uh, before you think about what they can give to you. Do you have a question? 
good about the previous slide. I was actually wondering if that chart applies to any type of job. Because, like, I don't know, let's say for faculty search, I wouldn't see networking uh, much. Right? I mean, so it's all different types of jobs. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is, this is general, right? Yeah. So for different industries, different skill sets, you know, if you're looking for a PhD research candidate, they're going to rely very heavily on your, your, kind of your background, your academic skills, right? But uh, networking always comes into it. So even for a faculty position, you know, the head of the faculty department for the engineering may know that, hey, next semester we're offering three new courses, and we have to find some professors to fill those roles. But they haven't printed the course catalog yet. They haven't got around to posting a job description. So if you're in there talking to the faculty director or the, the dean on a regular basis because you want to try and network, he may, you know, he may say to you, oh, you know, hey, we've got this new course coming up next semester. Would you be interested? Or you could ask if there any new courses or opportunities for me to do you know, add to the lecture and things like that. So I think it's still important. And if nothing else, even if it goes through the traditional resume round, you're in front of that. You're kind of in front of that whole curve, right? So if they're already thinking of you, um, you, know, you put yourself in a better position, I think. You know, make it easy for people. 
that's a big thing I talk about when I'm writing resumes is that, you know, hiring managers have literally hundreds of thousands of resumes that come across their desk. A lot of them look the same. A lot of them are boring. A lot of them are hard to do, right? You want to be able to smack people in the face with the information they're looking for, to put it bluntly, because they don't have the time to look for it. Nobody wants to read the entire resume. They're probably looking at it on their cell phone while they're on the way to the next meeting or walking down the hall. You know, and that's the reality. It really is. Um, so you have to make sure you frame your value proposition, what you can bring to the employer, in a way that, number one, communicates it effectively, quantifies it, but is also really easy to read. So that, that's important to format. So you know, make it easy for people to find you. Um, you know, have a business card, have a networking card that you can give people when you're at an event that has your name, your, your phone number, your email address, maybe your website, whatever it is that you do. Make it easy for people to find you. Uh, have a profile on LinkedIn. You know, make it easy to uh, understand you know, what you're looking for. So if I have a conversation with you and you're looking to get into the electrical industry, you know, make sure you weave that into the conversation so I know that. Um, you know, it's important that I know what you're looking for so if I can help you, I will, right? So, you know, don't hide those things. Make sure they're out there talk about it. Questions? Is there a question? So as a question, Stephen, you know, in the research that you have, you know, you have a different of the team. How would you make yourself valuable? So I think in that case, it's a lot about maybe, um, you know, research you're doing. You know, so if you're kind of focused in one area of research and you want to get more into that area or you've got some skills in that area, you know, talk about the work that you've done, the research that you've done, and how that may apply to someone else in their business. You know, maybe you have uh, knowledge of a certain process or something like that that you can bring to the table and talk about. Um, you know, it's all about conversations, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the next couple of slides. It's kind of how to get that dialogue going. Um, and then, you know, act like a matchmaker. It's kind of a, you know, um, ponder of an industry term. If I know somebody that can help, if I have two people in my network, right, and person A is looking for somebody who's an expert on some topic, who's person B, I want to connect those two people together, right? I want to be that matchmaker. Um, and to give an example, so you know, maybe a guy in my network, in my you know, ISM <coughs> network, is having a real problem manufacturing the product. Tons of quality issues, just can't get off the line, et cetera. It's costing the company a bunch of money. Another guy in my network is you know, a Six Sigma black belt expert on the manufacturing. I may say, hey, you should give you know Bob a call because he's a he's a six sigma black belt. He might be able to help you out. You know, try and connect those two people together. And when you do, you know, two great things can happen. Those guys connect with each other, um, and you know, maybe scenario A is they find out there's not a great fit, you can't help them. You know, okay, no big deal. But you've kind of introduced them and you've shown person A that you've got a valuable network of skilled people in it, and you can help them out in the future. They're going to come to you again looking for help, um, or they may return the favor and help you out. So their network. The better scenario that these two guys meet up, you know, uh, the company hires a consultant, he comes in, fixes their problem, saves them a bunch of money. The company is, you know, super happy because they fixed their problem, but the consultant is super happy because you got him a client. And now these two people are kind of, you know, in your, uh, in your goodwill, and will certainly look to return that favor down the road. You know, so, so connecting people together, although it may not have an immediate impact on you, down the road, that can always return, you know, tons of value. So keep that in mind. All right, so, who would rather spend one hour at the dentist as opposed to spending one hour at a networking consent session? Sometimes I get a lot of hands to go up for that because you know a lot of people hate networking, right? So I want to hear from you guys. What are some of the things you hate about networking? Raise your hand and just call it out. What do you hate about networking? I just feel like it's awkward and strange to meet somebody like right. right. So it's it's awkward, right? What else? So it can be unfair. Okay, so perhaps somebody who's a better qualified candidate didn't get the position because somebody had a stronger network did, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what you know, but it's who you know. Yeah, who you know. Right? But who knows you? So if you didn't get the job and you're a better qualified candidate, I would argue that that's your responsibility to make sure they know that you're a better qualified candidate, right? I'm not saying you specifically, I'm just saying in general, right? You have to promote yourself to make sure everyone understands what your qualifications are. How do you do that? Through talking to your network, through you know, having a strong resume, having a good LinkedIn profile, maybe other social media platforms. So what else? What else do you guys get about networking? Sometimes people are faking it. They're faking it? Okay, so yeah, right. They're just, you know, you can tell they're not really listening to you. Like 
so it's a competition. It's very it feels salesy and yeah. used car sales mentality, right? Just over here. Uh, sometimes uh, companies post like job postings or like qualified candidate, but ultimately they end up taking someone they already know about. So basically they're basically Yeah, so sometimes yeah, sometimes companies uh, you know have a job and they know who they're gonna put in that job. But they still go through the effort of posting the job online, interviewing five candidates, telling all those five candidates, sorry, we're gonna hire this guy when all you have to save that. And, and yeah, I mean that's a frustrating thing from a job seeker perspective, but sometimes companies go through that kind of a, a protocol, you know, because they have to. Yeah, but that's the waste of your time, but it's a waste of your time. Maybe. But but is it really, right? So, okay, you, you put together your resume, so maybe you had a chance to update your resume, that's a good thing, right? Maybe you had an interview, right? That's a good thing because you know, honing your interview skills is also another very important thing to have. So how do you get good at interviewing? Do more interviews, right? Um, so, you know, I make it a point, I interview two, three times a year, every year. It doesn't matter if I'm working for a job or not. Number one, it keeps me in touch with the market, right? And number two, it keeps my skills of interviewing uh, better. You know, and then, you know, I've done some wacky interviews, I'm sure you guys have too, where, you know, really a lot of times I'm just trying to see how you react to situations. Um, so the more you do it, the better you get. You know, you get those weird questions about you'll be able to think and react better on your feet. So even though you go through a process, you don't get the job, look at it not as a waste of time, but as an opportunity where you can develop some skills. Okay. All right, we'll one more over here. Two more. Not that I hate anything, but I find something difficult, uh, which is to maintain a connection. So for example, now I met you, and uh, we know each other, I exchange business cards, yep. go back to all, I go back yep. to my lab. And we never talk again. Right. Maybe we exchange some emails, try a little bit, right. concentrate with you. But then I find no reason to contact you right. again right. unless there is a reason, unless I need something. Right. And then when I need something, then it may, it's not my value, yep. right. it's your value for me. So That's good, I like that. It's it. really hard to maintain it when, uh, unless you're immediately looking for a job tomorrow. Right. Uh, so it's maintaining those connections, making lasting connections, right? That's right. Yeah. And then being valuable to your network. Uh, and being able to give things to your networks that get yeah, things from. Yeah. And there was one more back there. Yeah, and I'm going to touch on something that is a problem for me and probably a lot of people in this room, and that is the language barrier. Sure, sure. And uh, so I quite find it uh, uh, kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I make mistakes, that, right. and that's not that good for me to yep. go over and no, that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, point to bring up. And I mean, the room, the room today is very diverse. Um, I actually do some volunteer work at the University of Bridgeport where I got my MBA. And they have a, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the University of Bridgeport, but they have a significant um, you know, population of students from other countries. The you know, majority of students come from other countries. And that was part of the reason I wanted to do my MBA there was because I could go into a classroom and be immersed with people from countries I've never heard of. You know, and get exposed to some of that cultural difference. Um, and so a lot of the students that come through their uh, program have language barriers. Um, not only language barriers, but they show, they, you know, it's, it's a different market here than it is in the country where they came from. You know, the way you get a job is different. Um, and so their career services department uh, puts a lot of emphasis on trying to help people kind of navigate through that and get familiar with it. And so I'll go in and you know, work with them and we'll do mock interviews. You know, so you have a safe environment to practice your interview skills. Um, and I'm sure you know, you kind of offer similar services to their career services department. Um, even your student associations, you know, things like that nature. But again, it's kind of, you know, the more you practice, the better you'll get at it. You know, and one of the things that, you know, I always take part in, one of my professors said to me, one of our classes that I always try to remember is, you know, do what you hate now, right? So do what you hate now. Don't put it off. Um, you know, if there's something that scares you or something that pushes you out of your comfort zone, just do it. Go and do it. And you know what? You might not be great the first time, but you know, you'll get better. Right? So it feels awkward. Do you already uh, hold that roaches? What's that? Hold that roaches? Hold, yeah. like hold roaches? Um, like, like, you know, the, you know there is someone uh, who is owning that, uh, you know, the last you know, you know, they're great, but uh, they don't know you. So they still don't talk to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends, on, it depends on the environment, you know, whether you're going to be at a conference, whether you're going to, like, literally go to the company's door and knock on it. Um, you know, there's certain ways to do things, I think. Um, you know, it's always, you have to look at kind of the environment, you know. Um, people aren't like a huge fan of just walking in the front door and, you know, saying hello. Sometimes it can work, I mean, I was in sales for a long time, and I mean, part of my job was to walk in the front door and, you know, network my way into the organization, you know. And uh, sometimes, you know, I would, I would set up five appointments and all five of them would bust and I have nothing. 
Um, but sometimes you, know, you start talking to the admin or the receptionist, and you know one thing leads to another, and you kind of work your way in. And it may take three or four times, three or four follow-ups. Um, but that's what happens. I mean, I would sell. I used to sell critical power systems, so all kinds of uh, products that would support data centers and medical. Um, so we would call on engineers, um, and I would go in and I would help engineers design systems. And a lot of the engineers, you know, I would I would go in and I would call on them and give presentations and lead the literature, and then you know, I mean, I get anything for six months a year. But then when they had that big project, you know, they'd open that binder, there would be my business card, they call me in. You know, so sometimes it's not immediate, um, but you know. And that's where persistence comes in. You know, if, I'm, if I wasn't persistent in those roles, if I didn't keep calling on them every other month, even though they had no projects, you know, they probably would have thought of me when that project came around. You know, and I had cases like that where you know, bigger, better manufacturers, better manufacturers would call me by once, and then they'd never hear from them again. But me who was in there you know, every couple weeks, being consistent, they give me the business because you know, they thought of me and they knew I was there. So, uh, I forgot this. So, so, who's been to a networking event in the last like year? Raise your hand. Okay, good. How about the last like six months? How about the last month? Okay. So, you guys are pretty active. Um, all right, so a big part of it is you know knowing what to say, right? How to start that conversation, how to, how to, how to make that call. Um, and so, is everyone familiar with the elevator pitch or, or what that is? You know, it's. Um, for those of you who don't know, just to kind of reframe it, you know, you're, you're on your way to work in the morning, you know, your alarm didn't go off, you slept in, you're, you're late, uh, you spilled your coffee on the way to the office, you dropped your briefcase in the parking lot, you kind of get to the front door of your company just in time to see the elevator go upstairs and you're like, oh, that's a great, great start to the day. So you sit there kind of waiting for the elevator, finally you come back, you jump in, you hear somebody say, hey, hold the elevator. So you hold the door and, you know, it walks the CEO. Doors closed, you've got 30 seconds to make a good impression, you know, what do you say? Right? You can sit there in dead, you know, awkward silence, you know, which is a lot of times what happens. Or you can take that 30 seconds and you know, use it to promote your brand, you know, make a good impression on CEO, so that sort of thing. So you know, the elevator pitch is something that's been around for a long time. You know, maybe you want to call it a branding statement, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is, first of all, does anybody have an elevator pitch? Do they volunteer to deliver here to the audience? Anybody? Okay. So take your uh, uh, index cards. What I want you guys to do is just kind of draw a, uh, make a, make a quad, you know, make four quadrants, like this. And we're going to start over here. And we're going to say, you know, this is my, this is my elevator pitch, my branding state. Um, and I like to say it kind of breaks down into, you know, kind of the who, the what, the why, and what I call the pitch. Okay. So the first part, if you want to write down just the first, you know, the first line, you know, who. That should be pretty easy for everybody, I think. You know, who are you? It could be, you know, your name. Uh, hi, my name is Steve. You know, kind of a, a trick from like Dale Carnegie is you say your name twice, right? So, hi, my name is Steve. Steve Bouchard. Kind of makes a better impression and it gives a little bit more ability to remember you. Um, you may add a little something on there. You know, hey, I'm Steve. Steve Bouchard. I live in Connecticut down by the shoreline. Or, you know, I'm here at UConn studying. You know, such and such. So that's the easy part, who you are. The next thing I would say is, is a what, right? So what do you do? You guys have to excuse my handwriting. What happens when you grow up on a keyboard, right? You can't write anymore. I heard that they don't actually teach kids cursive anymore in school. I don't know if that's true or not. That's what I heard. That's what I was kind of But it's true, I have a whole thing. So, so what do you do, right? And going back to, again, making it easy for people to understand you know, kind of what you do and, and connect with you. Um, you know, have a sentence or two about what you do. What are you studying? What are you researching? Um, you know, what's your area of expertise? You know, so take a minute to jot that down on your card. And it should be more than a sentence or two. A side note, anybody uh, here listen to like TED Talks? <coughs> anybody know Simon Sinek? He gives one of probably one of the better or best uh, talks I've seen on kind of marketing. And he says that, you know, when you talk to people at, at corporations, people that are just out in the workforce, you know, a lot of people know, you know, what companies do, right? You know, I'm an electrical manufacturer, I make software, I make cars, I make tires, whatever it is. So a lot of people can tell you what a company does. You know, fewer people can tell you how a company does that, right? So how do you make tires? How do you make a car? It's a pretty complicated process. 
how do we write software? So fewer people know how it happens. And they said, very few, if, you know, if any, can articulate why. Right? So why does the company do this? To make money, I guess. But a lot of companies have a broader purpose. Um, so I think the why is a really good talk if you guys you know, have a chance to check it out. Uh, the why is very important. You know, who you are, what you do, but why are you doing that? Why are you studying engineering? You know, why are you going to school to get your PhD or your master's? You know, what's your broader purpose in life? What's your goal long term? So be able to articulate that. And then what can sometimes be the challenge, or in a very kind of situation specific or contextual, is the bridge, what I call the bridge. I kind of so um, how can you take the three or four sentences that you just kind of you know, spit out in the last 30 seconds, how can you connect it to the person you're talking about? So, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is why I do it. How does that relate to you? Right? So, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's uh, in a certain industry, how can what you're doing kind of relate to them? How can you kind of make a bridge and ask a question? That's, and that's a great way to do it, is you kind of give your speech when you ask a question. How can I help you sort of thing? Not those words, but, um, you know, how, how can you break the there you go. Okay, so maybe think about that. So yeah, another thing came out of the um, you know try, try different events. I'll, I'll let you things. Try different events. You know if you go to a couple of networking events for the mechanical engineering society, you're just not feeling it. Doesn't feel right. You're not having fun. Try something else. Maybe go and meet with the electrical engineer. Because we're typically a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> or you know try a totally different thing. Go and join the you know the outdoors club at UConn uh, or go to the rec center. You know, try something else. If you're not having fun. Try something different and find out where you have a good fit. And then, you know, because it shouldn't feel like you're forcing yourself. You should enjoy it. Right? And then, you know, again, the thing that came out of our conference I was at in Chicago was, you know, it, it takes three seconds of courage and a smile. So you walk into that room and you're dreading it and you say, oh, this feels awkward and it's salesy and everyone's fake. You know, get yourself pumped up, three seconds, walk up to somebody, smile, and boom, give that elevator speech. And, and then as soon as you do that, it gets so much easier because you've kind of gotten past that first barrier, and then from there, it hopefully it'll be a little easier. Um, so you know, the great thing about networking is that people love talking about themselves, so if you ask the right questions, you know, you can let them do a lot of the work. Just have a nice, right? Nice back, and relax, take a nice. So uh, what would be some good, so, so the next quadrant I want you guys to make over here, number two, would be uh, relate with questions or conversation starters. Who, who has some good, good networking questions or conversation starts that they can volunteer here? How about the Red Sox? Oh my gosh. You're in pretty neutral territory here at UConn, but if you said that down where I live, it might be a problem. <laughs> it would definitely get the conversation started. But no, that's good. Sports. I mean, sports is always, it's a lot of times something that you can you know, start a conversation on. Uh, you may go one way or the other, depending on you know, where they lead you to fall. That's a good one. Sports. What else? The weather. The weather? <laughs> what is it? What time is it? <laughs> so so we, like to, we like to ask open-ended questions, because if you ask me what time it is, I'd say it's 12.50, kind of running over time here. Um, but a lot of times, you, you know, if you ask a yes or no question, it's going to be a yes or no. If you ask what time it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be So what do you say? It's here or somewhere. Yeah. You can say, nice walk. There you go. I like, I like that better. Nice watch. Where did you get it? Perfect. That's good. I like that. That's actually really good. Um, and, that, and who knows? Maybe the watch came from you know his uncle that lives in you know Europe and it was handmade. Who knows? It's a great story. So that, that's good. If you can if you can see something yeah something that's personal to the person, maybe their their suit is real nice or their shirt, shoes. That's a great one. I like that. What is the risk? Yeah. It could be. But you know what? You're missing that very second. I would rather go with professional friends. Well, you could. It depends, it depends a little bit on the environment, right? So, and who you're talking to. You know. But a lot of times people don't want to talk about work because that's what they do all day. And now, now it's 6 o'clock and I'm at a networking meeting and the last thing I want to do is talk about work. I want to have a cold drink and talk about something else. You know. So, you know, it depends on the work. And you know what? If the conversation doesn't go anywhere, hey, it was really nice meeting you. Here's my card. Feel free to give me a call if I can help you out. I'll see you later. And that's another thing is being able to get that kind of exit out of the conversation because you know I've been networking events where too 
you know, you're talking to somebody, they just, you know, okay, great, we got them to go up and now they don't stop much. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, I want to meet some more people in this room. So, you know, how do you get yourself out of that conversation? Just, again, real, real, real quick, hey, it was really great meeting you. Nice talking with you. Here's my card. If I can help you out, you know, let me know and just move on to the next person. So, you can get out of the situation. If you're talking too much, maybe not talking at all. That's the way to do it. So, here's, you know, jot down some questions on your card. Uh, some, some questions that you can be comfortable asking in a networking session. Uh, these are some other you know, suggestions. All right, and then moving on to the next segment. We're going to label this where. We're going to kind of do a little dotted line here. Where and who. So we'll start with where. So where, you know, where can you guys network? Any ideas? Conferences everywhere. Any other answer? Super, super, uh, you know, general, but good answer. Conferences, uh, you know, student associations, SAGE, we talked about IEEE, you know, Mechanical Engineering Society, ASME, all those different things. Those are very focused on engineering and kind of industry specific. So how about some other ideas kind of outside of engineering where you guys might build a network? Talked about sports over here, so maybe join a softball league or a, you know, intramural uh, team. Volunteering is a great one. Yeah, absolutely. Volunteering is a great way. It's on the list here. Um, so, so start writing these down if you guys want. You can you know, jot down some ideas in your, in your uh, where. So volunteering is a great way to get experience and also to um, you know, maybe network your way into organizations that could potentially start as a volunteering you know, unpaid option, but ultimately you could grow into something you know, greater. Uh, you know, I have, a, I have a good, I put a star next professional association because I have a lot of respect for what they do and I think it's a great thing to be involved with uh, and it provides a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm an ISM for supply chain, supply management. Part of what I like about that organization is, you know, I'm in a manufacturing environment. That's where I work. But a lot of people in our organization are in healthcare, are in services, are in academia. Um, you know, so there's a very different pool of people and I can always learn things from them. How are they doing things? You know, what are you doing differently? Um, so, so again, hanging out and mixing with people who are different from me is important. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, networking happens on, on the meetup site. I don't know if anybody up here does meetups at all. Uh, it's you know, kind of familiar with that. I don't personally do it a lot, but I've heard good things about it. Um, you know, athletics, we talked about that. Community events, uh, volunteering, someone talked for talked about, you know, industry trade shows are another great way to meet a lot of different people and also see a lot of different companies. Um, and sometimes they uh, charge a high fee to attend, but don't be afraid to pick up the phone and ask for, you know, a visitor pass or a free pass, because a lot of times people are promoting those events, they want more people coming, right? They want the traffic. That's what makes it valuable to people who are paying to exhibit. So if you think that the cost to attend is maybe a barrier, you know, try picking up the phone and say, hey, do you have any passes I can, I can get for this event? I'm such and such study that you kind of really want to attend to use network. A lot of times that will, that will work for you. All right, so that's the where to network, right? How about uh, the who? So who's in your network already? Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, let's see. Uh, how you can start kind of putting the pieces together. You know, we talked about kind of personal versus professional. Uh, so there's different things up there. Um, you've got kind of your external network. Right? And you've got, if you're, if you're an employer, if you're in an organization, the internal network can be just as important. So in my company, where I work, I have to know people, right? I have to network inside that organization as well as externally. Um, because when opportunities arise for new positions at the company, I want to be aware of that. I want to know what's going on. And I want to know how I can you know, help people get into those places. Uh, so internal networking is just important as external. All right, so right now you guys should have kind of three quadrants filled out in your card, right? The elevator pitch, kind of what you say to get started, some questions or conversation starters, but kind of where and who to network with. We've got one more quadrant that we'll get back to in a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about social media. So who has a Facebook account? How about Twitter? Instagram, right? LinkedIn, I'm starting to fade off. Okay, now we got a lot of hands up. I don't, I don't know if anybody has seen this slide, but I thought it was kind of an easy way to look at all social media. Yeah. All right, I'm ready to get you soon. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, Twitter, I mean, the hashtag donut. You know, Facebook, I like donuts. 
Foursquare is all about like locations. This is where I get my donuts. Instagram, which is you know, big thing. Everyone says the big thing with millennials is they take pictures of our food. Up. So here's a busy story of my donut. Uh, you know, YouTube, here I am eating my donut in real time. <laughs> Skills I, I enjoy. I enjoy that you know, so it's just kind of funny that. And then there'll be there's probably 10 more, or 20 more that aren't on the list, and you know, a year from now there'll be 50 more that aren't on the list. Um, so it's a very interesting time when it comes to you know technology and social media because you, know, you guys have more access than anybody to information from all over the world, from, from people all over the world, and you have the ability to communicate information that you know to anybody around the globe. So it's an amazing time. Uh, but with that ability, I think also comes the kind of good, the great responsibility that you have to understand the information you're downloading. You have to understand if it's reliable. You have to, you have to vet it, right? Because just because it's out on the internet doesn't mean it's real, right? So understanding the kind of the source of the information, whether or not it's reliable. And as far as things that you're putting out into the network, you know, do you want it associated with you and the brand you're creating? So I saw, I came across this also on LinkedIn. I thought it was great. I said, before you put anything out there on social media, Number one, does this even have to be said? Number two, does it have to be said by me? And number three, does it have to be said by me now? Because recognize anything you guys do put out there, you know, through your Facebook, through your Twitter, is you know, it's tied back to you. And you know, you can bet that anytime you're going in for an interview, the guy behind the desk has already Googled your name, looked at your profiles, and just be aware that anything that's out there is out there. So I always tell people it's very important to you know manage your online presence. So how is uh, social media actually used in kind of recruiting and hiring? Here's some statistics from you know, uh, a recent survey. 94% of, of uh, HR people say it's an essential practice. So they're always going to look at uh, you know, LinkedIn or, or finding people through the online pages. Um, you know, they use LinkedIn 93% of the time. So LinkedIn is by far you know, the go-to source for that talent acquisition. Um, you know, the thing to take away from this slide is that social media, social recruiting has in, you know, increased the quality and also the quantity of the candidates that companies get to evaluate. So they're not looking at just people in Connecticut. They're looking at people you know, all over the country, perhaps all over the world, because they've got a budget for relocation, or maybe it's a virtual position. Maybe you don't need an office. The job I have today, I can work from anywhere in the world. All, all my teammates are scattered throughout the globe. As long as we have a cell phone and a laptop, we can do our job. So, um, you know, if you're not present on that social media spectrum, you may get overlooked. So make sure you have a presence out there, manage it, and make sure it's professional. And of course, you know, we talked earlier about referrals are the highest quality source of candidates because you know that candidate's already been vetted by someone. So you know, uh, recruiters like that, hiring managers like that. So going back to the, the donut slide, you know, there's a whole bunch of social media platforms, but really only one is professional. So you know, LinkedIn by far is the largest online professional networking site. As you guys probably know, it's founded by uh, Reed Hoffman back in 2003. Uh, recently went public on the New York Stock Exchange to an IPO, and currently has about 225 plus million members across 200 different countries and territories. So I think there's probably about 250 countries in the world. You know, almost every country is represented, and you know, 225 million members. That number is growing fast. Um, so it's the place to be, right, for, for online networking. You know, we can talk, honestly, for hours about LinkedIn, uh, but we kind of only have time to hit the highlights. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, basically being there is going to put you, again, in that larger, more qualified pool of candidates that HR and recruiting are looking at. Um, you know, make sure your uh, profile is complete. You know, have a photo. Have more than just a general job description. You know, um, I do a lot of profile writing for people through LinkedIn, and, you know, understand LinkedIn is a, is a search engine. Right? So you guys are all familiar with SEO, search engine optimization. You know, when a HR can uh, person is looking for you know a software programmer, you want your profile to come up in that search. So the more content you have in your profile, the better. You know, LinkedIn has character limits for certain fields, and you want to maximize that. So you, have, um, you know, quality versus quantity. I get this question a lot. You know, should I connect with everybody that's You know, I'm a big advocate of quality over quantity. So some people will grow their network on LinkedIn to 5, 10,000 people with the goal and the thought that, hey, the more people I have on my network, the more connected I am. Okay, maybe that's true, but I argue you want to have people in your network that you trust and that can validate your skills.
skill set, and that when someone comes to me and says, hey, Steve, I see so-and-so in your network, can you introduce me? If I look at something, I don't know who that person is. What does that say about me and my network, right? So, you know, only, I, I have the only kind of people you know, you trust, and you want these network. The other thing, you know, you guys are all familiar with new skills in LinkedIn, how people can endorse you for skills, right? How many people have endorsements from people they either don't know, you know, never met, or they're endorsing you for a skill that you've never worked with? Right? I mean, it happens a lot, right? So that's, that's a, it's a challenge because sometimes they're endorsing you for skills that you maybe don't want to associate with yourself or you're not really an expert in, right? So how do you manage that? And, and LinkedIn's response is, hey, that's your responsibility. You should only let people into your network who know you, who know you well, and will endorse you for the skills that you want to be endorsed for. So LinkedIn kind of takes that responsibility. Um, so be aware of that. You know, authenticity is important. Um, you know, just like anything, you can't embellish your resume, you can't embellish your LinkedIn profile. You know, be who you are. And that's really kind of the end of that. Uh, authenticity, I think, is key. And again, we talked to a panel of kind of HR recruiting people, and they said the same thing. They want, they want people to be authentic. Um, you know, R&D with LinkedIn, research and development. Yeah, and I kind of use that term in a different sense. You know, you as a candidate, or you as a person looking for a job, you have no excuse for any reason. You should be able to walk into that interview you know, know all about that company, what they do, what is their mission, what challenges are they facing, you should know about the industry, because all that information is available to you through the internet, through LinkedIn, you know, there's a ton of information there, so you can use it to your advantage to leverage that. A caution is that, you know, LinkedIn is not the only source of networking, so, you know, if you spend eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, kind of behind the computer screen, you know, networking on LinkedIn, and you're connected to tons of people, you know, that's great, but you gotta get out into the traditional, okay. You've got to meet people, you got to shake hands. So again, you know, use LinkedIn as a tool, uh, but don't use it as your only source of networking. And kind of three takeaways on LinkedIn. You know, remember LinkedIn will change. You know, it's a software program. Software is always being improved. So it's dynamic, it's going to change. They just recently rolled out a bunch of new features. Um, so you know, me, who, who helps people with LinkedIn, have to get you know, up to date on those changes to be able to communicate them and train people on them. Uh, but you as well have to be able to understand like, how LinkedIn is changing. You know, make sure you back up your content regularly. You can export a PDF of your profile um, because certain things may change. Maybe your account is locked out. You know, LinkedIn will lock you out and, and actually take away your access if you do things that violate their terms of uh, use. It doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. So you know, make sure you prepare for that. And then you have to diversify. Like I said, you know, use LinkedIn, but don't only use it. Use that as kind of a, a tool in your kit. So do's and don'ts. You know, you see some mistakes up here. Um, I think one of the probably the biggest mistakes in networking, even though a lot of times the purpose of networking is to find yourself a job, right? Is to actually ask for a job. It's, it's you know it's such a turnoff because it, it puts an onus of responsibility on me if you go and ask me for a job and it's awkward and it's weird. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, I was at a career fair right here at UConn uh, not too long ago, and you know I must have met 60, 70 students that came up to me, and I only remember a few, maybe two or three. A lot of kids came up and said, hey. I've got an engineering degree, I'm looking for an internship, I've got a you know, marketing degree, I'm looking for a job, when can I start? The people, that I, the people that I remember are the ones that came up and started a conversation, right? So they said, hey, I was at your website last night, and I noticed that you had a sustainability initiative with your company. Some of the things that I've done in sustainability are blah, 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 blah. You know, immediately in my head, I'm thinking, okay, this person has done some research, they're prepared, right? They've got some relevant experience that ties into my organization. And immediately I'm thinking in my head, how can I connect this person with somebody at my uh, company that runs our sustainability initiatives? So she didn't even ask me for a job, but already I'm thinking about it. And that's just how it, that's how it kind of works. So think about that, you know, when you're out networking, don't ask for a job, but start the conversation and people remember that. Um, you know, not providing any value, like you said. Um, you know, find a way to connect with people over the course of time where you're adding value. You know, hey Steve, I know you're in manufacturing and electrical products. I came across this article on LinkedIn, but it might be interesting. But maybe it's relevant to what I'm doing, so I can read it and I get something out of that. Plus, I, I just you know, thought of more I remember this person. So that's a way to kind of reintroduce some values and connections. Um, you know, being too self-centered, not showing gratitude. You know, always thank people for, for what they do for you. It goes a long way. I'm a big uh, believer in that. Um, not following up with losing touch. You know, your, your network becomes stale. We talk about only using LinkedIn or only using technology. You've got to diversify. Um, and, and you know, don't wait to get in touch until you need something. You know, be in touch with people kind of constantly. Like you said, it's, it's a constant, you know, lifelong, career-long process. 
maybe it's something you do without even really thinking about it. Um, we talked about you know sports sometimes can be a, a touchy topic depending on where people's allegiance lie, but also things to avoid, you know, political, religious, you know, overly personal topics, things of that nature. I think that's probably common sense for most people. Yeah, you want to make it like personal, right? So I don't want to get an email from you that's, you know, a blast of 30 people. Here's a neat article, wow. right? Like that's to me, that's not valuable. It's like spam. So what you want to do is you want to understand a little bit about what I do and where I'm working and things of that nature. You know, I travel a lot. Maybe travel is important to me. You know, and I want it to be a personal email that has some relevance to me. So I think that's that's the key is making it personal because a lot of people it's, it's really easy to find an article and you know send it out to your entire network. But where it has value is where you know it's actually relevant to me and it has some impact on what I'm doing. So I think that's the key is making it relevant. So here's some tips. So we talked about kind of what not to do. Here's kind of what to do. Tips for success. Um, so you know make a goal and stay accountable, and that's really what we want to do for the next quadrant of our of our. Uh, index card here. So I want you guys to put together an action plan. Right, so you've got over here, you've got kind of where, where you can network, if we can network with. So in this last quadrant, I want you to just jot down, you know, hey, I'm going to attend one networking session with you know, ASME before the end of the year. Or I'm going to, you know, join an intramural football league, you know, for the winter break. Uh, so I want you to have a goal with a timeline to it. Put that down and, and you know, maybe you have two goals, maybe you have three goals. But put something down on paper that you can then hold yourself accountable. Okay. You know, always follow up when you meet somebody. You know, if it's a valuable person you want to actually network within 24 hours, follow up email. It was a great meeting at last night's event. I enjoyed our conversation about such and such. I look forward to keeping in touch. Short and sweet. That's all I have to say. Nothing crazy. So I think that's See how you're doing, what you're up to these days, and just you know, start a conversation that way. Again, people love to talk about themselves, so you may get a big response back as well. And doing this is where I've been. You know, and I would say yeah, absolutely. And I do that a lot. I mean, people that I, because I, you know, I go through, I use LinkedIn to go through my network and say, oh, I haven't talked to this person in quite some time. I should reach out to them. So I mean, that's a great way to do it. Is say, hey, we haven't talked in a lot. I want to know what you're up to. Tell me what you're doing these days. Here, here's what I'm doing. Real brief, what you're up to. Um, you know, if you're going to go to a networking event, treat it like an important appointment. Right? So put it on your calendar. Make it something that you can't skip. Like, treat it with respect. You know, get into a routine, make it a habit. If, you, if you're joining an organization that has maybe monthly meetings, etc., you know, make it a habit, go to them regularly. People will get to you know, recognize you and be familiar with you. But if you don't want to go by yourself, find, find a friend to go with. You know, go as a group. That, that always takes some of the pressure off. And, and going back to kind of you know, don't ask for a job, another great way, and this is kind of for established relationships with people that you know well, is to ask for a recommendation. So say I lost my job today. You know, I might be at a networking event and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be applying to some engineering job down the road. Would you mind if I use you as a reference? Because then you're not putting the person into an awkward position of, you know, find me a job. Um, but now they know you're looking, or at least you're open to opportunities. They don't even know that I lost my job. They just know that I'm looking, right? So if they come across an opportunity, they may, hey, hey Steve, you know, I heard you, I remember you said you were applying for some jobs. You might be interested in looking. So that's a great way to kind of, you know, inadvertently ask for a uh, so, anybody familiar with Tom Friedman or read the book, World is Flat? Okay, good. So, he's, he's a real uh, respected authority on kind of globalization. And I wanted to end today with just a quick three-minute video from Tom Friedman and then just a few takeaways. Um, so, we're just about done here. Uh, he talks a lot in this little clip, just real quick, a couple minutes, about you know, how the economy is changing and how, you know, because of all the technology that we have, you know, the bar has been raised a lot higher. And what used to be considered and accepted as average in the past is really no longer even applicable because average is over. You know, the bar is higher now. So if you are average, you're going to become obsolete. And so I think it's a great um, kind of motivation factor for you guys. I think it makes a lot of great points. And it ties really into how you can keep yourself from being average through that. So enjoy this quick little clip and then we'll close out. This is going to be a great time to be a person. Well, in the hyper-connected world, I mean, you have the world's 
every, every book, every bit of knowledge in the world available to you through Google entirely for free. Twitter gives everybody a free megaphone and publishing platform for free. Amazon.com, you can now actually not only get anything from a buzzsaw to, um, to a book at the best price in the world, but if you want to become an author now, you don't have to go through my publisher, Farrar Strauss, and send them a hundred different letters to beg them to look at your manuscript. You can go now through Kindle Publishing and publish your own, publish your own work for free. What a great time to be a consumer. It's going to be a great time to be an individual entrepreneur. Fantastic time. If you just have a spark of an idea, now if I just have a spark of an idea, I'm going to Delta in Taiwan and I'll design that thing. Skip over to Hangzhou, my friend Jack Ma, Alibaba will line up 30 Chinese manufacturers to make this one. Jump back over to Seattle, my pal Jeff Bezos, who will do my fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for Walter for Christmas. Craigslist will get me an accountant. And on freelancer.com, I can get someone to do my logo for $19.95 unless somebody else bids $18.95. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur if you've got this. My view is there's no more developed in developing countries. That's so round world. The world's going to be divided between HIEs and LIEs, high imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. Countries that enable this are going to thrive. And countries that don't are going to fall farther and faster behind. Could it be a great time to be number one in your field? If you are J.K. Rowling or Michael Jordan, well, in a world where you can now access every individual market, the returns, the winner-take-all returns, are going to be fantastic. Not going to be a good time to be number two in your field. And it's certainly not going to be a good time and this is one of my central points, to be average. Because in the hyper-connected world, average is officially over. Your boss today, he or she has cheaper, cheaper, easier, faster access to more above average automation, above average software, above average robotics, above average cheap labor, and above average cheap payments. Average is officially over. They'll say in Texas, well, here's the result you've done, all you've done, all you've That is N-A, no longer applicable. If all you've ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is not all you've ever got. You will get below average and much faster. Right, so I hope that inspires you guys to take action, you know, network. Um, and if you want to flip your index card over and maybe jot down these kind of three takeaways that I got off of uh, one of the LinkedIn Number one, we talked about this a lot today, meet new people uh, in your area of interest every month or significantly deepen an existing relationship. So take action on your part to meet new people on a continuous basis or find a way to deepen an existing relationship. Uh, number two, you know, do something nice with someone in my network every week. And if you have to do that, you know, you'll be sure that your network becomes stale, your network becomes stale because you're going to continuously do things with people. And again, when you're, when you're focused on helping your network, the value for your network back about it. And then lastly, and I think this is one of my favorites, is you know, spend time with people who are different than yourself. So get out of the engineering climate and network with other people, in addition to your colleagues that are in the engineering field, because that's super important to diversify, especially in today's environment. And I would maybe add to that, you know, be authentic and be consistent. So you know, be authentic, determine who you are, what's your brand, and then be consistent in promoting that brand uh, across whatever platforms you choose, whether it's in-person networking, online, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, and just be consistent with that brand and that message. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the presentation today, and I hope that, that uh, index card kind of gives you a roadmap on how to get started. Uh, I believe we have some lunch in the back. If anybody has any questions, certainly feel free to ask, but I appreciate you guys' time. And thank you very much to uh, Sage for hosting the event.